Welcome, it's Easter morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. That's a great greeting, isn't it? Uh, you know the story behind it. It goes way back in the days of communism when one of the members of the Politburo was speaking one of these long speeches in front of a crowd and he was denouncing Christianity. He was denying the role of religion in the state. And uh, on the platform, there happened to be an Orthodox priest who glanced up to him and said, could I just have a few seconds to complete the message? He nodded, and then after the 50 minute speech, the priest got up and he shouted out, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And he did that three times. The whole hall was bellowing with an affirmation of Christian faith. And the communist leader didn't know where to look. So I say again, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Let's pray together in these words. Pray with me. Risen Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus we, we gather, gather today to, cel to celebrate. We gather to share, share in, in the, the joy, joy of, of your resurrection. resurrection. The, stone the stone has been, been rolled away. away. Death, Death has been defeated. defeated. You have, have overcome, overcome all the powers, powers of darkness. darkness. Risen, risen Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus. We, we adore, adore you and praise, praise your name. name. Today, Today you, you defeated, defeated death and rose again. again. You, you died on the cross that we might be free. Thank you, risen Lord, Lord that you, you did, did this for us so that, that we might enjoy the freedom of eternal life. May we know your risen presence with us today. Risen Lord Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We adore you. Amen. Now I have a bit of a treat for you. A few days ago I was talking to Paul and Haley Blakeman and they were telling me about how their son Leonard, not Arthur, he's the little one, but I'm talking about Leonard now, um, who is a little bit higher and stands a little bit taller than Arthur does. And he'd seen me in one of the daily reflections that I do and he said to his parents is the minister going to tell us on Sunday that God defeated the coronavirus I love his faith Leonard your faith inspires me to think how Jesus rebuked the wind and the rain on the on the boat in the storm and so I would say mighty God destroy the coronavirus you can do it, do it, Lord. Wham, bam, and it's done. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose from the dead. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose from the dead. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose from the dead. Wow, I hope you got that. Isn't that exciting? Some aerobics for Easter Day. Now, just to be clear, what Leonard was doing there was he was picturing Jesus died. That's with his arms outstretched as with like a cross. And then we said, Christ was buried. And so for that, Leonard wrapped his arms around himself and bowed his head. And then he said, Christ is risen. And he, rose, he raised his arms high and looked up to the sky. Can you do that with us now? Leonard's going to lead us again in some aerobics. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose from the dead. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose from the dead. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose from the dead. Did you enjoy that? That was an action creed for Easter. Thank you, Leonard Blakeman. That was wonderful. 
Now I want to come back to the countdown challenge that we've been doing for the last four or five Sundays. Uh, I gave you a word last week, and the word that I gave you was Palm Sunday. Remember the previous winners, twice was Stephen Ward, and then we had Heather McKenzie. But last Sunday, on Palm Sunday, we have a new winner, and it is David Granger for the word dual span hyphenated, one word. Now I give you a new challenge for the week ahead, and it's the word resurrection. That's got two S's and three R's in it. I think it'll be a good challenge for you. Today, in our message, we're going to be thinking about the evidence for the resurrection. It's going to be the last in our current series on apologetics looking at big questions on the Christian faith. People ask the question, there's no evidence for the Christian faith, is there? There's no evidence for the resurrection of Jesus rising from the dead. Well, is there? We're going to look at that briefly this morning. But before that, uh, we're going to have a song, a worship together, and Piers Bowser is going to lead us in Christ alone. And then we're going to have a Bible reading for Easter Day, from Anne McDevitt. And then following that, there's going to be a very special reflection, thinking about one of the Marys in Jesus' life. Not Mary, the mother of Jesus, but Mary Magdalene, who met Jesus in the garden. Think and reflect on these words. But now, let us worship God. Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry 
to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from his hand, till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from his hand, till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand, till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Our reading this morning is taken from St Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. The Resurrection After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Palm leaves crunch beneath my feet, shattering into hundreds of pieces as I slowly drag myself up the hill, longing for the comfort of my own house. A place of peace and familiarity in the midst of all the confusion of the last few days. I look down at the massive branches. How is it even possible that a week ago these leaves were lush and green, standing tall and proud as they were waved in celebration? The sun is peeping its head over the stone walls. I can feel the warmth on my already flushed cheeks. They feel sticky and tight from the dry salty tears that clung there this morning, the way that I had clung to him in the garden. Dried leaf fragments twirl and dance in the early morning wind, swept along with no clear path or purpose. They remind me of myself before I met him. No one has ever had such a profound effect on my life. So when they took his body off the cross and declared him dead, my world ended. The focus of my life disappeared. I saw the way he loved people. I experienced it. A love so deep and so pure 
everyone should have the opportunity to feel like that. Completely accepted. The way he challenged injustices made me want to stand up and fight for people. Fight for the vulnerable, the scared, the outcast. As I reach the steps to my front door, I sit on the top one where I have sat many times before, and I try to remember every moment of the last few days. Saturday's a blur. I spent it with the others. Not much was said, but it was felt. We all felt it. The shock, the grief, that love, that love which now held us all together. There was hope. He had said that he would come back, but that felt so impossible. We had all seen him die, watched him take his last breath. I am shaking, overwhelmed with the impact of grief and fear, which in the last few hours has transformed into relief, joy, hope, disbelief. I take a deep breath, lift my head to the sky and open my eyes. Today is a new day. This morning, I saw him breathe again. I felt his breath on my skin, felt his heartbeat, heard his voice whisper. My Lord, my God, my friend, my brother, There, standing in front of me, his body restored, life filling it more fully and more vibrantly than it had ever done before. Peace fills me. The shaking stops and I get to my feet. I look out on the streets surrounding my home, watching members of my community start to go about their daily business. They have no idea what has just happened how the whole world has changed. This means life. This means love. This means hope. Something happened 2,000 years ago in the Middle East. Something that sparked the birth of a messianic Jewish faith that turned into a movement of several billion people. No one can deny that. In fact, the question that we have today is, what could possibly cause such a stirring? For example, how did Jesus' well-documented enemies, I'm thinking of Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, how did he become one of his most devoted followers? How did Jesus' friends, who deserted him in death, and now I'm thinking of someone like Peter, how did they decide to die for his cause after his death? And I want to say to all who find it hard to believe in rising from the dead, we're looking at the question of, is there really compelling evidence 
for the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I could give you a whole list of things here, but I'm going to keep it simple this morning. And I'm going to say that there are three main areas, three main aspects to this. The first is the appearances of Jesus. Many claimed that they saw the risen Lord. At least 550 people on at least 11 occasions over a period of six weeks said that they saw Jesus and gave an account of it. Now, even if you could just say one or maybe two of them could be passed over as kind of hallucinations, it just wouldn't be possible for all these over such a space of time. And then there's the question of the disciples, not only the appearances of Jesus, but the disciples themselves who suffered for their bold preaching and witness. Men don't behave like that unless something tremendous happens, something to drive away their fear and disappointment. Psychologists understand this. People who have been through war and difficulty understand this. Something huge must have happened to transform frightened people to become fearless. And then thirdly, and most significantly of all, is the empty tomb. For no one could produce the body of Jesus. You know, it would have been very simple to have ruined the witness of the Christians, that marginal group in the Mediterranean area in that first century. See, all that their enemies would have needed to do would have been to produce the dead body of Jesus, to destroy that Christian movement at the very outset. All that a thief, the authorities, or someone would have needed to do was to find that state dead body and produce it. You know, it isn't really credible that the disciples or the authorities or, the, or any tomb robbers could have stolen the dead body. Now, I have to confess to you, uh, in this period of self-isolation, I've been watching some legal thrillers recently. And I, I realize that for any lawyer, one of the most astonishing things about the story of Jesus Christ is that the witnesses, the evidence, the witnesses of his birth and the witnesses of his death. Who were they? Well, at his birth, it was the shepherds on the hillside, most unreliable people, people who were uh, disregarded as thieves and robbers, and this was a job that get them out of society. And then who were the witnesses at his resurrection in the garden? It was the women who themselves were regarded as totally unreliable. You would not have put a woman in those days as a main witness in the courtroom. But let's look at what the two women in Matthew's gospel story did. Think about their reaction to the earthquake, their reaction to the appearance of the angel, their, their reaction to seeing the empty tomb. The text simply says, with fear and joy, they ran to tell his disciples. Haley, thank you for the beautiful rendering of that musing of Mary Magdalene this morning. It puts all this into context for us. Now I want to show you a picture. What does this say to you? How do you feel? What do you think? How does this maybe speak of joy to you? Actually, what does the word joy mean for you today? What brings you joy? Let me put up another image. When did you last feel joy so much that you wanted to share it? And how are you going to share the joy of Easter today? Let me ask you too, can we experience joy in difficult or hard times like now with the coronavirus 
and the experience, the awful experience of self-isolation. <laughs> Do we have to be like Tigger? You know, in Winnie the Pooh, the story of A. A. Milne? Do we have to be as joyful as Tigger, bouncing and bouncing around? One thing I, I realize that as most of us grow older, excessive exuberance puts us off. We say fairy tales are fine for children, but we like to think we've come of age. And so we distrust happy endings, even if secretly we still long for them. In all of television soap stories, when a person appears to have found their perfect partner, we instinctively know that in the storyline that relationship will not last. And that's because script writers find conflict and tragedy to be far more interesting than stories of harmony and love. And maybe also we confuse joy with happiness. Think about this. Few of Jesus' first disciples died in their beds. They were filled with joy, but their lives did not have a happy ending. It was the North African bishop of the early church, St. Augustine of Hippo, who said, a Christian should be a hallelujah from head to foot. The sheer joy of those first witnesses was authentic and infectious. Christians from other cultures have much to teach us about joy. Joy is not about just getting a religious fix, but it's about fixing your eyes upon the risen Christ. We get transformed, you know, by meeting Jesus. We are getting transformed by meeting with the one that we worship today. I'd like you to pray with me now in these words. Let's pray together. Risen Lord Jesus, roll away the stone of our doubts. Let us trust you. Roll away the stone of our reserve. Let us proclaim you. Roll away the stone of our heaviness of heart. Let us rejoice in you. Roll away the stone of our fear. Let us find our hope in you now and through all eternity. Amen. Now let's worship God with a fantastic Easter hymn. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son, which will be led by Howard Stevenson on the piano.
Friends, let's gather together. Take with you the joy of the risen Lord and share his joy with all whom you meet. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. And we say together, To, to Christ, Christ be praise, praise to, to the, the cosmos, cosmos hope, hope, to the, the city, city peace, peace, to the, the church, church courage. courage. Amen. Amen.